Be, 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 be. What is this? What is this? It's just Gerald, and it's just Ger- and it's sad because it's just me. You ain't getting nobody else. Dudes on romcom dot com. That's who we be. That's who he is. That's who we are. And by we, I mean me, because today is just me. Dennis, where is he? I don't know. Dead? No, he's not dead. He's off um, gallivanting around the Texas flatlands. Having all kinds of fun, I'm assuming taking all kinds of peyote and having a vision quest. But he's not here right now. Who's here? Me. Why? Because I love you. <laughs> or toler- And you tolerate me if you even exist. And you you probably don't. I could have just... I'm screaming into a void. And nobody cares. Because right now I'm going to talk about Julia Roberts and Dermot Mulrooney. Who, by the way, isn't Dylan McDermott. But I I will probably confuse those two many times. And I'm here to talk about my best friend's wedding. Why? Because it was a movie that I sat through. Again, because I love you. This was a tough one, boys and girls. Um, Back in the day, I will admit, I watched this because it was on. I didn't, I mean, it wasn't wasn't forced upon me. I I did this to myself. I didn't really have a problem with it then, and, 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 and now I do. Now it was real rough. It was very hard. Uh, probably because now I've loved and lost, and, um, and I understand now that all the stuff in this movie is complete crap. None of it is real. None of this stuff ever happens. And now I'm going to go through it as fast as you can. Um, okay, so the opening music number, which apparently in the 90s was a thing. I don't, I don't know why, but it, it was. So, there was a legit rendition of Wishing and Hoping for like three and a half minutes of this movie. It is the beginning, it is the whole song, and they do it on a pink background with four women, none of which, zero of which, ever appear again in the movie. Why would you do that? Who are these people? Why do they go away? These are all kind of questions that I can't ask anyone because no one knows the answer to it. Well, I'm sure there's someone who knows the answer to it, and I'm sure it was some weird, arty answer that was like, oh my god, I have this great idea. You know, the kind of answers you come up with when you're on drugs. The kind of things that are like, you know what? I'm going to make a giant meatloaf, and in it, I'm going to put Fabergé eggs. Boom! Egg meatloaf. Guaranteed million seller and then you sober up and you go that's real dumb don't do that that sounds gross and slightly painful and you go yeah because you sobered up but apparently if you're on like a drug induced haze and i don't know the budget of a julia roberts movie you will get away with doing that oh but on a side note for people who listen to this very podcast which is i'm sure like four people in alaska or maybe one guy in russia because russia man they have bots that, like, ping every website. I'm just, uh, you know what, I'm getting to behind the scenes of life. Um, <clears throat> and while I don't hate the song Wishing and Hoping, I didn't need this. Just made it a really long movie. But, on a side note, like I was saying, there's a woman in here uh, who is one of the bridesmaids. I think she's in pink, but it's very hard to tell because everything's pink. But um, she later... Played the bride, in, well, the first bride in uh, the wedding planner. So that was a thing that happens. As you know, she she wasn't typecast. She wasn't always the bridesmaid, never the bride. She got to be the bridesmaid and the bride. And then she went on to do other things, um, a bit, and then um, and then still acts, po- possibly in other movies, definitely TV shows. Anyway, after that. The movie started. Um, so, okay, so there's a chef, right? There's this dude immediately started into, uh, with more people that we will never see again and are, um, n- have no, uh, nothing to do with this movie. They're just, not, they're just, they're just there. Uh, we go into this kitchen at a restaurant with a chef yelling at his other chefs. Chefs? Cookers? Whatever these people are. They prepare food. And he's a very, well, yelling is a bit of uh, an overstatement. He is calmly threatening murder 
upon his staff. In which a very calm man, in a very calm voice, well, a slightly, a slightly energized man in a very calm voice says, I will kill your whole family if you get this wrong. Talking about, I'm assuming, a creme brulee. Creme brulee? Is that how do you say that? Doesn't matter. Us, a dessert, or a lamb, or possibly uh, an appetizer. I don't really know. The point is, see, Julia Roberts, this is all to show us that Julia Roberts, I like to think, uh, her character anyway, Juliet, Julianne, another thing that's not Juliet, or Julian, but Julia, not Julia, but very close. Um, it's all here to show us that she's a terrible, terrible person. She's a horrible human being. And they show you this by making her a food critic. Because, um, well, she's a food critic. See, back in the day, before Yelp, when you could, when being a food critic was a real job, uh, going to high-end restaurants and judging people on their life's work so socialites can dine at the finest eateries and, you know, I could make a reservation six months in advance and then just call it quits after I couldn't get it and just go to the, get a burger at the nearest greasy spoon and have a better time. You know, when these people rule the roost, uh, they would just... Ju they're just judgment. That's all they are. They're complete judgment. They're the worst people to talk to about dinner. They're the worst people to talk to about, well, really anything. Because they have a very pointed opinion, and they have to really get into the minutia. And uh, I just I just want to eat a, a, a food and then go away. That's all, that's all I want. And it's, you know, it's a major city, so probably tip like 25% or something? I, I don't know. I really, I really wish... Uh, tipping was a gratuity uh, instead of a mandate. But then I should just move to another country. That's not. It's not gonna happen. I. I don't. Uh, it's not gonna happen. But uh, yeah. So we're introduced to Julie Roberts as a terrible person, judging people immediately, uh, and her gay friend, because. Um, it's a movie targeted at ladies, so they often have, uh, the protagonists have a gay friend. Not a lot of dancing in this movie with the gay friend, like, you know, just as a thing they do. I mean, they dance at the end, but not a lot of, not a lot of dancing as a, as a whole. By the way, okay, so Paul Giamatti is in this movie for some strange reason. He's just, like, he's basically, like, a magical Negro near the end of the movie who, like, basically rocks up as a bellhop taking someone's luggage somewhere and Julie Roberts is just sitting there like smoking in a hallway in a, in a high-end uh, hotel. And he just, he magical Negroes, or he just comes down, as magical Negroes do, uh, he imparts some zen-like wisdom upon her and then he just walks off and honestly, 100% guarantee, I can't guarantee it because the thing I felt, trust me, this is what I felt. When I watched it, I was like, I, I, I was half expecting him to just disappear as he walked away. Like, like he was literally magic. Like he was a magic Negro who fell in a vat of chemicals and got his skin bleached like the Joker. That's what I really was expecting. He's got curly hair. He was really expecting and a real high forehead. I was really expecting not saying a thing. It's not a race thing. It's a little bit of a race thing. Um, but it didn't happen and I got real, I got real sad upset about that but uh moving on so okay so they keep telling you okay they're not really telling you but look as a concept i believe that platonic friends totally a thing it's totally a thing you can have women who are friends and men who are friends with women and women who are friends with men and zero shenanigans going on it can totally happen i have that other people have that totally happens However, in this movie, they're just like, oh yeah, well they have moved on past that month and a half, three months, six months, nine months, when they were totally banging, getting down on a regular, they moved past that, and now they're just friends, except for they're not really past that, and they still harbor these feelings towards one another, and you can totally see it when she literally goes to his wedding 
to steal him away from from his fiance. That is the entire reason why she's there. That's the only reason why she wants to be there. That's she just wants her man back, even though she gave him up. But f that. She planted a flag in that man years ago. Although I guess uh, gender wise, it went the other way around. Whatever. Um, and uh, now she wants it back. She's claiming that section of the moon. That there is uh, J-Town. Uh, I feel like that's a thing. Uh, I don't really know what, though. Make it up. Go ahead. Write in. Tweet me. Don't tweet me. Email me. UnoPotatoVids at gmail.com. It's a thing. I'm just saying, if you feel like defining J-Town, let me know. But anyway, I mean, okay, so we're like, yeah, they're platonic friends, except for he's, she's there to totally steal him. And it was really confirmed when he just walks into the dressing room, she's just wearing her underwear, and I get it. I understand. You guys used to have sex all the time. But uh, we've now crossed that section where you don't get to just hang out in the room because you won, because at some point in time you had sex with these with one another. Just get to hang out in the room where they're just mostly naked you don't get to do that especially when you're about to get married like in two days you don't get to do that you shouldn't do that you definitely shouldn't be the guy who does that because this is crossing some lines and then when you're there don't hit on her don't flirt don't flirt with her because that's what can give people ideas and you know what she got an idea and she formulated a plan to ruin your gd marriage this is what happens when you show you're gonna flirt a little bit that's what happens you deserve this however you don't deserve her, because she's a monster, and I don't, I don't want to wish her on anyone. It's a real big problem. Yeah, but don't. I'm just saying, don't, don't like chill out and like, hey, we're like friends, so you know, I'm gonna hang out with you in your underwear, and then I'm gonna check you out, and I'm gonna say I used to see more you more naked. Yeah, it's just weird. Okay, just don't do it. It's just strange and and uncomfortable. And would you be okay with your uh, with your fiance doing that to one of her exes that she's now buddy buddy with? Just standing there with his wangus all hanging out in his in his uh, in his perfect pecs. I'm sure. I don't know. I feel like she's a socialite who gets who has like a lot of money. So that means that she definitely you know, hangs out with people who uh, who are unemployed because their dads make a lot of money and then just spend a lot of time doing crunches and pull ups. So like ripped like Jesus, I just I just feel like that's a that's a thing, which which makes you wonder why she picked this man who's like in who's like thirty, she's like twenty. No, she's not twenty. No, she's like nineteen twenty. No, twenty one. No, she's under twenty one. She's under twenty one. That's right. She's under twenty one. She's in college. She's under twenty one. When they go to karaoke bar, she orders a beer and they do not card her, which is not a thing they would do. I mean, he just wouldn't do that. I mean, she's probably 22. But you throw you throw a bone. You, you, you ask her for her thing. That's why she feels good about herself. Because you don't ask a 20-year-old for their car. They're going to... I mean, they might as well just kill themselves. Because they feel real sad about themselves. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing. I don't know. I, I'm not 21. I'm way over that. And I occasionally still get carded. But that's what happens... When you have a baby face. <sighs> it's hard to explain to people why that's terrible. They don't get it. Because they don't want to grow old. And when your face refuses to, then women will reject you because they think that you're a child. And you're like, I'm older than you. By like six years. <laughs> or, possibly, by like a decade. Stop it. Anyway, um, moving along. So, you know, I feel like Cameron Diaz's character, who is, you know, the bride to be, um, the woman whose marriage she wants, uh, Julia Roberts wants to ruin. Uh, I feel like she didn't try hard enough to have friends. Again, her dad is uh, rich, and uh, she's in a she lives in a major city, and she's in college. And she went to high school, presumably, so I feel like she has friends that she can call to be in her wedding. Although we don't see any evidence of this in the movie, she seems like a girl who spends a lot of time scrapbooking 
uh, and driving like a maniac on a highway, but I feel like she probably would have had friends throughout her life. How can you not have a, you know, a maid of honor? That doesn't make any sense to me. But either way, she doesn't have a maid of honor and loops Julia Roberts into this because they've never met before. But yeah, sure, okay, I guess I can put you in charge of my that whatever maid of honors do at a wedding. I I don't get it, but whatever, sure, why not? I mean, seems like a good idea. I mean, you have two cousins who are fairly young. They're under 40. Oh, they're sluts. Oh, I guess I guess they can't have a hen night. What 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 is the what is it that Julie Roberts does that these two women women cannot do? I have no idea. I I don't know, especially especially since I would love to go to a party with these two women. For no other reason than at the end of this movie, one of them legit gives a blowjob to an ice sculpture of Michelangelo's David. Not just some random dude named David, Michelangelo's David. He's got big hands, so I feel like that was a thing. But a tiny wangus. Why would you put your mouth on that? Also, that is a table sculpture made of ice. Why would you do... Look... Why would you have that at a wedding, first off? Second off, why? what in your head? How much alcohol and roofies did you do, maybe Molly? What did you do that says, you know what? I'm going to crawl on top of this table in front of my family, including my parents, and I'm going to put my mouth on the young David's painter. I, I want to see... That part of the movie. That is a digression that this movie severely lacks. Just this woman choosing to put a a, a chiseled, carved, and crafted uh, male genitalia made of ice into her mouth. Was her cocktail not cold enough? Did he say on the rocks and just put nothing in it? Like, what happened? Did you... I, did you have, like, some really spicy chicken wings? And you're like, oh my god, all I need is an ice cube directly inserted into my mouth. Something that I can suck on for five to six minutes. So it all just will cool down. And the first thing you thought was, look, there's Michelangelo's David formed out of ice. I'm going to go put part of that man in my mouth. The point is, she got stuck. She couldn't get her mouth off of his painter. That happened at the end of this movie. Why? I don't really know. But uh, I feel like, since this was written by a man, I feel like a Tina Fey script wouldn't have had this in it. Oh, also, I feel like the lead character in a Tina Fey film would be in some way likable, which we all know she can do because she she made Mean Girls. And Mean Girls is starring an actual Mean Girl that she made nice. So, that happened. Which would have been... I mean, if that... A man. Ah, oh, Tina Fey. Here's a question that has nothing to do uh, with this movie. So, I just watched... Um, last week, at this point. Uh, all of uh, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt Season 2. And uh, I had a thought while I was watching it. Some mild spoilers for Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt Season 2. Um, I don't really know why I find drunk Tina Fey kind of attractive... I don't really know why that is. I mean, look, I like Tina Fey, but uh, for some reason, gets hotter when she's like all crazy and drunk. Well, compared to the other her in in the uh, in the show, in the episode, yeah, the, the the pent up her versus drunk her. I go like, I would like to hang out with this woman. I don't even really drink, but I would like to hang out with that woman, who's kind of a problem. And then I think, don't do that. That's a weird thing to say. Also, it kind of makes you sad. And I go, yeah, it does. Anyway, moving on back to this movie, because uh, it continued to happen in front of my eyes, so I'm going to continue to talk about it. Um, okay, so I have this, like, legitimate beef about this movie. I, it made me real upset. Not in a cry way, but in an anger way. Like that vein in my forehead was popping out, and I was like, "Why, why are you doing this?" And is this girl, who's like under twenty-one, and like barely out in the world, has 
gotten so far in her um, studies. She's moving through college. She's in uh, an architecture major, an architectural major, or whatever you phrase that as. And she's like, I'm going to quit. I'm going to throw the idea of a career out the window, and I'm going to follow my man, who is a sports writer for baseball, uh, which means he doesn't make a lot of money. I'm going to follow him on the road. I don't need a career in architecture. What would that ever get me? Other than I'm probably just guessing here, like a really modern looking house and some awesome uh, glasses from my vision goes bad because all I do is like just draw lines on graph paper. I have no idea how architecture works. Just, uh, just stereotypes. But I was, I was really, oh man, I was so pissed off at this. I was like screaming at the screen, like, why are you giving up your life for this man? This is, look, statistically, this is going to end in divorce. Why would you want to do this to yourself? Don't be dumb. Don't be dumb. Get a job. Get an education. Oh my God, you are the most blonde woman I've ever met. And then I think I threw something at the screen. Luckily, it was soft. Didn't actually break anything. But I was very annoyed. But, oh, man, I was so pissed off about that. Anyway, so there was a karaoke bar in this movie because karaoke is a thing that people enjoy. I will never do karaoke. If you drag me to a karaoke bar and ask me to sing a dumb karaoke song, I am not. I'm not going to do it. But I will sing in my car when I'm alone because I'm human. And don't ever ask me to sing in public because that's just not going to happen. I'll admit, maybe happy birthday, because I've done that. Uh, but that's an ensemble. An ensemble. I will do that, but I will not do it alone. Ever. He said, knowing that one day he might actually break that rule. Um, anyway, so that's this karaoke bar, which Cameron Diaz's character hates karaoke. Like, loathes it with a passion. I don't understand why you would loathe karaoke with a passion. Just it's not your thing, so don't go there. But she doesn't like it. And at that, at this point, I pretty much realized that whoever wrote this movie has no idea how karaoke works, just like at all. They pretty much say that if you are uh, just in the bar, that means somebody can just pass you a mic. Some drunken woman in the table behind you will lean over and just give you a mic, and you have to sing it. You have to sing it. Which song? Whatever song is going to play next, because that's how it works. It's like a giant game of hot potato. That's not how karaoke works, D-bag. It's just not how it works. In any way. And then she gets up and sings, and she's terrible. And for some reason, they... A, the crowd falls in love with her, which is fine, because it's karaoke. Even, but they were, like, booing her before. Again, this woman did not ask to be up there. She never gets to the stage. And somehow, without actually looking at the words to the song, actually knows the song. Although, that's the first music break in this movie, of which there is another. And it's weirder. Much much weirder but we'll get to that in a second because this woman never looks at the music she never reads the words she only stares at her man i don't get it and for some reason her terrible terrible singing makes him swoon even more why they don't really go into that i think it's because sometimes when you watch someone you love do something really bad it is like oh well they're trying isn't that cute the way she fails because she was perfect, but now she's not perfect. I like watching my woman fail. It's so hot. I think. I don't know. I couldn't tell you. It just came off as a real, human, genuine moment, I guess. Except for it was really contrived. So I guess it's not really human, genuine moment if it's that scripted. But hey, it's a movie from the 90s about love. Anyway, moving on to the second weird, totally strange, unneeded, uncomfortable uh, musical number. Look, there's a dinner scene. Okay, there's a there's a dinner scene for, uh, I guess, the wedding, or just because they have dinner as a family, as a very large family. Both the, the bride and groom's parents, maybe it's a rehearsal dinner, I don't really know. It was at a regular restaurant with seafood. Look, it was an open restaurant, everyone can, uh, you know, and it was just these, one table with, uh, with the family, and Julia Roberts, uh, 
fiance who's just her gay friend because they're lying about being a fiance, but her gay friend uh, pretending to be her fiance. And they ask her, they ask him, they ask them like how they met. I bet it's a real cute story. And he goes to give a crazy story, literally crazy because it involves going into an insane asylum or a sanitarium or whatever it is that you want to call it. Um, where she was being held because of some obsession she had. And he's like, oh my god, I saw her as a vision as she was going into shock therapy or something, some crazy thing that you wouldn't actually think, oh, you know what, I'm attracted to that woman that is clearly insane. I'm gonna go get that girl's number. No, you wouldn't do that. But he's trying to mess with her. He's just screwing with her. He's screwing with her by saying all these things that are true, but what he does after that is break out into song and you're like all right this is weird because we've all been there when somebody just starts singing right or when you're uh, having a conversation with someone who happens to be a poet and they just start throwing out like poems for no good reason like why are you just reciting a poem to me we were talking about like we we're talking about going to the grocery store why are we talking about poems now why do you have to relate everything to poems this isn't mass effect one i'm not trying to talk to you ashley you know this is this is real life stop reciting poems in the middle of a street in new brunswick it's weird that happened once to me by the way um it's very it's very weird uh art, artist types are strange and i know this because i'm because i'm one of them not a poet though those people are weird but so this dude gay friend his name is george breaks out into song and i'm like this is strange this is uncomfortable why would you go into a crowded restaurant and start singing a song? And then the mother kicks in, and then everyone else eventually kicks in at the table, and you're like, okay, is this a thing that people do? Like, is this a thing that white people do? Because I have never experienced this in my life. And then it gets surreal, because some dude who works at this restaurant, which sells seafood, drops what he's doing, not literally, but he stops whatever he's doing, I'm, assu I'm assuming waiting on a table, goes straight over to the piano or keyboard that is just sitting in the restaurant instead of, I guess, I don't know, a lobster tank? I don't know what this was there for. And just starts playing along. So he knew the song, and he knows how to play it on a piano, and he just rocks up and starts playing on it. And then every other person, wait staff, everyone sitting at a table, starts singing the song. This never happens. Is this a group delusion that those two slutty girls who clearly do drugs, because again, one of them, it was s just sucking off a David. Not just any David, by the way. A, uh, a, a, a Adonis of David's. Uh, because she took something, I swear. Had to. Had to take something. Because that's just not something you do. You don't just go off and just like... <sighs> just start sucking on man parts in front of everyone without, uh, you know taking a little something or getting paid for it um but they all start singing this shared delusion everyone in this restaurant started singing and then they just stopped and it was all okay this is one of those moments where you realize real life is uh you know movies don't work out like they do in real life i mean we all know this because there are so many happy endings in movies especially in america but also in the way that how does that moment end in a restaurant like, how do they, oh, everyone in the restaurant sang, and then they cut. What if they didn't cut? The song is over now. W what, do, what do we do now? Do we, do we clap, then just go back to eating our lobster bisque? Is that, a, is that a thing we do? I guess so. That was a weird shared moment that we had. Okay, I'm going to ignore them for the rest of my meal now, and then we're going to pay the check and leave. And then we're never going to do that again. But we'll talk about it till we die. That's... Probably what would happen, actually. That's, yeah, it's totally what would happen. I just wrote the end of that scene. There you go. Voila. Okay, so more than halfway through this movie, where Julia Roberts is hardcore trying to break up her friend and his fiance. Hardcore, just trying to ruin someone's happy, soon-to-be marriage. Their happy relationship. And again, I'm supposed to root for this woman? Who's the protagonist of this movie? Who's the good guy? This is one of those movies you realize you're actually just falling around the villain the whole time. And love prevails, but not for her. Thank God. She does not deserve to win in this one. But uh, mo more than halfway through this movie, we hit the real conflict. The mother load. The big one. The email. Oh, 
the email. This woman, who is, again, a garbage human being. One of the worst people in the world. If this woman is your friend, set your friendship on fire and kick it into a river. Or possibly set it on fire, stab it to death, roll it up in a rug, and throw it off into the ocean, off in Bayonne. Do that. Do that for me and everyone else in the world because it makes you a better person. Because this woman, I am being so nice by calling her a woman because sea bombs are not nice in America. But this woman, oh my God, she literally crafted an email and then said it was from Cameron Diaz's dad and then wrote it to her best friend's boss and said, you need to fire him for the betterment of his marriage, because he will not do this. And then she didn't send it, but she kept it on the hard drive. And then, because this is basically a Chekhov's gun situation, because it's not her computer, she wrote it on the dad's computer, then her secretary, or his secretary, sends all the emails that he just had laying around, because that is a plot point that needed to be said, apparently. So, boom, the boss gets the email. And what does the boss do? And this, by the way, is a thing that I find hilarious because it doesn't make any actual sense. It is the strangest thing that this man does is that Dylan McDermott, not Dermot Mulrooney, or Dermot Mulrooney, not Dylan McDermott, it's that one, um, he gets a letter the same day in an envelope that he just pulls out of somewhere I don't know where. I guess that scene was cut. He pulls out this letter out of the envelope. He reads it, and it is the boss writing a letter to his employee to tell him that the family he's marrying into is GD horrible. Now, the thing I find that absolutely hilarious about this is, is this man, whoever this man is, this old school uh, editor of baseball or the paper a dying art form um decided to receive an email and instead of hitting forward and then writing a message he prints it well he writes i'm assuming copies and pastes the actual email into a word doc writes a thing ahead of it telling him these people that you're marrying into are terrible and then he hits print Prints it out, folds it up, you know, because you got to fold it in threes to fit in an envelope, because that's how envelopes work. This does not seal the envelope, now that I think about it. So he had to get, like, an intern, or uh, hire a, a delivery service, or run it across town himself, and then hand it to someone who got it into the hands of Dermot Mulrooney, not Dylan McDermott, and, uh so that he can open it up and read it later. You could have just hit forward. Now, I, I know, I get it, I get it. It's a convention of the movie because she, he's not in his room or at his house and he needs to read the letter in front of Julia Roberts so she can feel real bad and she needs to read it too and we didn't have laptops that could just run around all day. But not the point. It's real dumb. It's real dumb because what you'd have to do is the dumbest thing in the world. Call him. Leave a message. On his phone. He's got a cell phone. It's just a thing you can do. Whatever. But we all need to feel that Julia Roberts feels bad at this situation. And she does. She feels kind of bad that she did that. Because that email wasn't supposed to go out. But this woman, who is again a monster. A monster. The worst kind of person. Doubles down and still tries to break these people up hardcore like after she got in trouble gets totally busted in a way she didn't actually get busted but the email went out and she's actually going to destroy these people relationship oh my god and she's almost got the man she almost got him and he decides to man up and actually go to the pre pre wedding breakfast uh, again this is a thing with people who have a lot of money this is not how normal people get married i swear we don't go to a country club and you know, like, have a giant breakfast where everyone needs to dress up and then have a wedding in six hours. It's not a thing people do. Weddings take too long anyway. I like them on television when they say, I do, and then they say, I do. 
and then they walk out. Everyone throws them with throws rice at them, pelts them with other things, and they get in a car and they run off, and then they go off to some magical place, and then they do all kinds of horrible things to one another in in, in, a, in a in a nice uh, hotel, possibly at a resort. Um, but look, they go to this thing. They're at this breakfasty, lunchy thing in a country club. And Julia Roberts, who was not dressed for the occasion because she wasn't supposed to be there because, really, she thought he was done with this. He wasn't going to go and get married to this woman. But he, he's going to stand up and be like, oh, I'm going to tell them why you are not getting married. And then, of course, while he's sitting there thinking about it, talking to Julia Roberts, he's clearly still in love with this woman and definitely wants to marry her. And Julia Roberts is like, Damn it. And then he asks her to go see how, she, how Cameron Diaz is, is doing and how she really feels about it. And then she goes over there and she talks to Cameron Diaz and tries to talk them out of getting married. Throwing another wrench into the marriage, or attempts to. And then she realizes that Cameron Diaz still loves Dylan, Dylan McDermott. Dermot Mulroney. Every time. Um... And she relays this to him, reluctantly, begrudgingly, as you may. And of course, she still wants to win the guy. So what does she do right when she's like, yeah, you love each other and you both want to get married, but I love you and I want you to marry me. Pick me. She really, after the affirmation of both of their loves, was like, no, I'm still going to destroy your marriage. You pick me. I'm better for you. Me, me, me. This is our protagonist? Who is this woman? This woman needs to get hit by a car. This, sh- mo- this movie should have ended with her getting utterly destroyed by a car. Maybe the taxi driver from The Wedding Planner. This way we can have more of a connected universe in the movies that I've had to sit through. Um, okay, so here's the thing. By the way, we are robbed again. So they get married. By the way, they get married, and then... Uh, uh, gay friend George just shows up at the wedding. I'm pretty sure he was not in Chicago. I'm pretty sure they put him on a plane halfway through this movie, but somehow he is back. He's in Chicago at a wedding he was not invited to. So they can have a bit of a dance. That's nice. I guess. Whatever. Um, but before this, there's a moment when they're at this breakfast, lunchy thing at a country club where Julia Roberts is wearing two sets of sunglasses, one on her head, one on her face. And then at some point, she switches the glasses to the the one that was on her head is now on her face, and the one that's on her face is now on her head. And at some point, the one that is on top of her head gets put uh, around the collar of her shirt, and then they switch again, so now she's wearing the other ones. What I'm saying is, we missed this little bit of comedy here. We missed... Her realizing she's wearing two sets of sunglasses, uh, and then her doing, I don't know, some kind of, you know, it's a movie starring a woman, and it's supposed to be a romantic comedy-ish kind of thing, so I'm pretty sure she would have fallen down, because that's what, that's what they think uh, people find funny when it comes to women, is falling down, I guess. I don't know. Is, is this... <sighs> It's like, it's like everyone who writes a romantic comedy thinks that the thing that's funny about women is they fall down, and it's pretty much what Aaron Sorkin thinks about anybody. Oh, this is my comedy where Josh falls down in the West Wing. Ha 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 ha. I really like the West Wing, too, by the way. I watched that when I was in high school. That was a thing that you don't usually do in high school. I watched it every year I was in high school for seven years. That I was in high school. Or maybe I watched it for one year. And then immediately stopped watching it. No, I watched it for two years. Or three. One of those numbers is true. But I don't remember which one it is. Anyway. All I'm saying is, this movies, these movies are full of terrible people. What, I want to see a romantic comedy where everybody's good. Well, at least the protagonists are good. The people I'm supposed to be rooting for are actually genuinely good people. I have yet to see one, at least in this run of uh, the podcast. Not one. Not one decent human being. (sighs) 
They're just terrible. Anyway, so that's it for this week. Dudes on Romcom signing off. Uh, emails at uh, unapotato at unapotatovids at gmail dot com. Write me. Tell me about the things I asked about, or tell me that I'm human garbage, just like the people in these movies. That'd be nice. Get a little bit of interaction. Maybe we can fight about it online. Get in a real scrapes, or or not. Um. But you know, any questions or requests or suggestions? That'd be nice. Yeah, just hit me up. Any of us? Any of us up? You want to talk to Dennis? That'd be great. Maybe I don't know. Maybe for him it'd be horrible. I couldn't tell. I couldn't tell you because he's not here. Because he's off naked in the Southwest, uh, having a vision quest after drinking a bowl of peyote. That's at least my theory. Um, drinking the blood after slaughtering a, a deer. Maybe that. Maybe he's doing that. I don't know. I don't know what he's doing. Um, we'll find out um, next time. I guess. Maybe. Bye.